Yeah, so I'm going to talk about those two big buzzwords of our time, sustainability and leadership. And I believe the combination of the two are key if we want to enable life on this little planet, basically. And to start this discussion, I'd like to look at two worlds we're living in at the same time. There's one world I call white world, another world I call black world, and they coexist. We live in both worlds at the same time. First, the white world. It's a positive, optimistic view of how far humanity has come and where we are heading. You can look at some of the data, like life expectancy has doubled since 1900 to reach 70 on average in the world today. Extreme poverty has dropped from 55% globally to less than 10% today. Child mortality has fallen to a sixth in just half a century. And last year, a really interesting set of data is, it is estimated by the Brookings Institute in the US that more than half of global population was middle class or above for the first time ever in human history. So we live in a fantastic moment in human history. We made huge strides in human development and the future looks bright. Then I'm going to take you to another world, which is black world. We have serious problems providing food to a population that increases by 220,000 people every day. Fish are disappearing in the oceans. We are depleting topsoil. And we have 821 million people who suffer from hunger today. We have problems providing water, and MIT estimates that in 2050, 5 billion people will face water stress. We've done a real mess out of that wonder technology called plastic, right? World Economic Forum estimated three years ago that by 2050, plastic will weigh more in the oceans than fish. And finally, energy climate change, the big topic of the day. We've been talking about renewable energy, Kyoto Accord, Paris Climate Agreement for three decades. But still, the proportion of fossil fuels in the energy economy, that's oil, coal, and natural gas, that was 80% in 1994, is still 80% today. Not even a 1% change. So, we're living in a pretty bleak world and the future looks dangerous and uncertain. The funny thing is that both these two worldviews are true. They're all based on very solid data. But there's one little twist to it. The human development that we did achieve, and that is amazing, has to be underpinned by ecological pillars, a sound and strong and resilient nature. And that's where we are facing some real challenges today. And what we're trying to do, of course, is to move from mere survivability through sustainability, hopefully to a livable earth for 10 billion people. And the word survivability is a word I just, of course, made up. We would like people to flourish, to thrive in all corners of the world. And the challenge we're facing here is pretty complex. And I think this little wonder machine very well explains or sort of symbolizes this challenge. The air conditioner. Very appropriate that it was invented in the U.S. Actually, it was invented to lower humidity in printing factories. But then people discovered, wow, this is a smart machine that can make houses much more comfortable, in particular in Washington, D.C., which is hot and humid. It was introduced into the White House, the Senate around 1928, 1929. And the rest, as they say, is history. The aircon, as we call it in Japan, conquered the world. More than one billion units in operation today, and estimations are that in 2050, as the climate warms up, there will be 4.5 billion air conditioners in the world. That is as many as we have mobile phones today. But the funny thing is, of course, when you cool air inside your house, you get hot air outside. You get heat islands, you get a warmer climate, you want more air conditioners, you get a hotter climate, and then we have a classical positive feedback loop that is very complex to get out of. So we have an amazing technology, enabled us to work more efficiently, helped Asia also take off economically, but it's creating all sorts of other issues that we don't really know how to deal with. So what are the drivers for this very important change to sustainability? I'm going to mention three, and then I'm going to move on to the issue of leadership. Of course, technology is a key driver in this change, but will super-efficient air conditioners be enough? Even if we have super-efficient air, air conditioners, if we have 4.5 billion of them, even though we have renewable energy technology, we will still have 80% of fossil fuels in the energy economy. So obviously, technology is not enough. 
We also need shifts in systems, and that's the second key driver. Legislation, international agreements, business models. But even then, we need a third factor. Because how do we get people to actually introduce the legislation, the systems, switch business models in the direction that we need? And that's where the third driving force towards sustainability comes into the picture. Values. Now, for me, this is the most important one. What kind of mindset? What awareness do we have? What hopes do we espouse? What intentions do we have for the future? Without this third driving force, we will not move anywhere. And that's where leadership comes into the equation. Because I think we need, in this world, to move to a livable future, a thrivable future, leadership of a new kind. Look at the leaders who are out there today. They've failed us completely. They're leading us into, I'm sorry, death and destruction, if we go the way we go at present. So we need a new kind of leadership that inspires these new values that creates the new systems that we do need and that enables those new technologies. I believe we have the technologies that we need, but we need them to be implemented. So we need a kind of transformative leadership, and that's the other big topic I've been working on with a group of uh, young leaders from six continents. We're creating a network called Next Leaders Initiative for Sustainability, abbreviated NELIS, and we're working exactly around this issue and sustainability. Transformative leadership is lasting, deep change for the better in a large organization, a community, or a society. And we have, through three summits we've had with these young leaders in Japan, come up with something we call the five P's model of leadership. And I will conclude today by briefly introducing what this is about. We believe there are five guiding principles for transformative leadership that can help you in your journey towards a better future. The first is principle. You could also call it purity. The second P is passion, the inner fire, and how you maintain it. The third is positivism, especially the ability to find positive elements in a seemingly hopeless situation sometimes. The fourth element needed is patience, perseverance, persistence for sure. Transformative change never happens overnight. And finally, you need a dose of pragmatism. If you're just a mere daydreamer, if you cannot link your proposals or things you do to what people need, you won't get that far. And if you study some of the big leaders in history, sorry, I have picked two men here, but they were two very famous transformative leaders in the 20th century, Nelson Mandela to the left, Mahatma Gandhi to the right. They were certainly 5P leaders. I spent quite a lot of time studying the life of Nelson Mandela. How could you be imprisoned for 27 years, most of them on a lousy little island called Robben Island off Cape Town in South Africa, and still keep hope, still keep your passion, never bend a single principle. You keep inspiring people around you. You persist, and you're pragmatic enough also to negotiate with the apartheid South African government. Then he walks out of prison, and four years later, he's the first black president of South Africa. Apartheid is dis mantled within a few years. That is transformative leadership par excellence. You could find the same in the life of Gandhi, of course. So we could look at leaders both around us and in history that really projected these five Ps. But the final question then is for us, is this too much to demand for mere mortals like us? We cannot all be Nelson Mandela's or Gandhi's, can we? And I would venture, yes, we can. We do not all have to abolish apartheid, fortunately, but we all have the ability to inspire transformative change in the communities, companies, societies where we work and live. And certainly also, we need millions of young leaders equipped with these five Ps for whom sustainability is second nature and the goal of thrivability for 10 billion people on Earth is a leadership quest. And that is very much what I am working on personally right now. So finally, we can start with small steps. Look at your own five Ps. How well am I doing, if I'm honest with myself, around these five Ps? Then you can make a choice. Do I want to be a person with a big self or a small self? We can look at some of the big leaders. I'm not going to mention names, but there are some very egoistic males, chauvinistic males out there right now who may be big in position, but have very small selves, 
So think about the future. Think about other living beings and other places and have a big self. And then finally, it's just a journey. Maybe using these five Ps as guiding principles where you read, learn, develop yourself, test, fail, and rise again. But insist on, whether it's a leader in title or just working with a group of people, to be a leader of the future, enabling thrivability for all people on earth. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.